Welcome to the discussion of our brief history of treatment delivery techniques and quality assurance. Uh, my name is Thomas Bortfeld. I'm from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I'm here with Rock, Rock Mackey, uh, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Wisconsin. So we, we selected together we selected 15 medical physics papers on, on this topic. Our criteria were impact in terms of citations impact in terms of clinical relevance and innovation for the medical and research community. And uh, so um, without further ado, we will uh, just move to the first paper uh, discussion, which is uh, the paper from Michael Doherty. Yeah, this is a very interesting paper. So in historical terms now, kind of summarizes what radiotherapy was like um, in the mid 80s. So uh, essentially it was um, a, um, a coplanar treatment um, that uh, used uh, blocks. It could use compensators. And in fact, compensators are, are sort of the era's version of IMRT, but they weren't done um, with, optimiza with optimization, but typically for uh, missing tissue. But this was really the first uh, paper that uh, had a, a pretty good start at uh, defining uncertainty for radiation therapy. And in fact, at that point in time, the ICRU um, had really only said that those should be within 5%, but didn't really give any specifications. And, and, and this and other papers uh, like it uh, encouraged the ICRU to uh, better define the criteria for uh, prescribing, reporting, and recording radiation oncology that led to the concepts of the, of the gross tumor volume, the clinical target volume, and the planning target volume. And this particular paper really describes the basis of, of how one should view a margin um, uh, with respect to um, the uh, treating the GTV. Uh, I should point out that this um, paper um, does have an error in table one. So when you read the paper, um, the lung densities recorded there are incorrect. Uh, they should be the nominal lung density is 0.2 grams per centimeter cube. The minimum lung density uh, 0.05 grams per centimeter cube and the maximum lung density of 0.3 grams per centimeter cube. Go on to the next paper. I'm sure Rob, it was you were the first one who have noticed that mistake in the last 26, uh, 36 years, actually. <laughs> probably, probably. Uh, I, it's not a topic of conversation generally in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I wanted to also highlight maybe um, the essence of that paper it, to some degree was also to define the nominal scenario of the treatment delivery, which we normally take for granted as the only one we're looking at where all parameters are like, you know, uh, prescribed or like uh, determined from the planning system. Mm -hmm. But to, to add uh, like the worst case and maybe best case scenario. So the nominal dose in the nominal case and the dose that can be, have, you know, delivered in the worst case, say in the normal tissues, 5%, 10% higher dose or so. And then also on the other side, 5 or 10% less dose, and to always do the calculation based on these different scenarios, which then led to the idea of robust planning many, many years later. Yeah, in fact, he was applying project management principles to uh, really radiation therapy. All right, so the next uh, next slide uh, is uh, tomotherapy. Well, uh, this is uh, dear, dear to my heart, obviously. Uh, I'm the first author of this paper. Um, and this um, paper really described the first uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy IGRT machine, basically dedicated to IMRT and IGRT. Uh, as you can see, it had a, a binary MLC, um, and it had uh, a, a CT X-ray source uh, at 90 degrees to the treatment beam, and so the vision here was to be able to um, do IGRT with a kilovoltage uh, CT-like uh, beam. Um, it was never actually implemented in tomotherapy because uh, it just was another piece of apparatus um, that would have provided excellent images, but it turned out that the megavoltage image detector was probably good enough for setup verification while not being typically good enough for 
um, doing a planning uh, study of a patient. It also showed an innovative ring target. Uh, so in other words, if you're moving around, um, you're not going to overheat the target. Um, and so it was would actually possible to, to put in a ring target. You know, the only problem with this uh, is that at that time, the Linac vendor that was supplying uh, this particular one had a, had a uh, built-in target. So um, it really wasn't a practical uh, first, I first idea. Uh, but, but this machine led to um, what has become common in the industry of having a single energy machine, a machine that's dedicated to IMRT, in fact, rotational IMRT, um, one that has a single energy and no electrons and a coplanar machine. So uh, all subsequent machines pretty much uh, that have evolved after that, like the Bure, the Unity, uh, the Halcyon, uh, have followed the same uh, general principles. If you're doing IMRT, you don't need electrons. You, you don't need co non-coplanar beams generally. And, uh, and the single energy is, is in fact better than having a high energy beam for IMRT. Did you want to discuss um, the parallel development, development by Normus? In oh yes, the yes. System? Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a fairly interesting story. So, so the the concept of tomotherapy was patented uh, by the, the tech transfer group at the University of Wisconsin, um, and um, Mark Carroll, who is a brilliant uh, physician, um, really invented it uh, almost simultaneously, but. Since we beat him to the patent, uh, he licensed the RI, uh, RIP uh, for his Nomos Peacock machine, which really was the first IMRT treatment um, provided by uh, the Nomos Corp Corporation. And they sold about 70 of those machines. Um, and Wharf kept, uh, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation kept the general patent for a fully integrated machine uh, that, uh, that we that we ended up licensing um, for uh, a, a dedicated um, uh, integrated uh, tomotherapy machine. All right, we move on to uh, the third paper, which is about uh, intensity relation and generation of intensity profiles by dynamic jaws or multi-leaf collimators on general purpose Linux and multi-leaf collimators. So in parallel to the development of tomotherapy that Rob just described, there was a lot of effort on, on the side of you know, developing uh, IMRT capabilities for conventional linear accelerators using uh, MLCs that were normally designed for field shaping. And uh, the challenge was, of course, how do we, how do we uh, drive, how do we uh, control the leaves of, of the multi polymer so that they generate the desired intensity map you know, overall. And in 92, that there was a publication from a group in England, uh, from Convery and Rosenblum, who showed that it is actually possible to deliver arbitrary intensity profiles, such as the one shown here, by a unidirectional sweep of the multi polymer say with both, both leaves starting closed on one side and then moving over to, to the other side and closing again on the other side. So I have to move my hands closer to this side actually. So we start on one side, then we open the leaves at various angles and then we close them both on the other side. So that, that was demonstrated before. And then in, in 94, uh, this publication from uh, Spiro and Spiro and Chen Shui showed how, how the calculation of these trajectories of, of the uh, uh, multi -leaf leaves can be done very easily, actually. Uh, so the principle is shown here. Um, essentially, the, the idea is that the intensity at any point in the treatment field is proportional to the difference of the time from uh, when, when the first leaf crosses that point and opens the irradiation of that point, and the later time when the other leaf crosses that point and stops the irradiation of that point. So it's simple, simply this time difference of the leaf uh, crossing that point that controls 
the intensity at that point. So we just have to make sure that, that these, these, these times are proportional to the desired intensities as shown here. And uh, that, that was the insight that the group in Sloan Kettering had. But interestingly, it, it was an idea that was sort of ripe for its time because at the same time, in the same year, there were four publications on, on that same idea. Three others were published, one in PMB by the group from Stockholm, one in the Green Journal in radiation, Radiotherapy and Oncology from the group in Heidelberg, and one in the uh, Red Journal uh, uh, from the group in Houston, where I also uh, uh, participated. So again, an example of a development that was sort of ripe and then was even uh, developed and uh, implemented simultaneously, more or less, in different parts of the world. Yeah, and of course, th this is for a, a static gantry uh, uh, delivery. So, say for for five or seven fields, uh, if you're doing VMAT, then uh, the leaf sequencing is far more complicated um, than, than shown here. But this was definitely the root of it, and and probably probably for the first decade or so. Um, it was um, it was dynamic. It was either fixed static uh, ports uh, with the leaves moving between the ports and the machine coming on, or, or this dynamic program of sweeping the leaves until VMAT. Good. So in in this in this uh, static field port approach, one question is: What are the best beam angles that that we? Uh, how do we? choose the mean angles that give us the best conformality uh, to the tumor target volume. Um, that, that, that is a difficult problem uh, and it's still unsolved uh, until today. But, but here we have one of the earlier publications uh, by Jörg Stein and others. I was also a co-author on that one. Uh, and we showed that you have to use uh, optimization techniques that involve um, stochastic methods that avoid local minima. In this case, we use simulated annealing, and that, that is a very time-consuming optimization technique. Uh, but regardless, uh, uh, it, it is, it is uh, still to this point, to this day, an unsolved problem. What I wanted to highlight here is, is one interesting aspect, namely that the leaf um, direction choice in, in IMRT is not intuitive. Let's assume we want to treat this U-shaped target volume shown at the top with the organ at risk right in the center. So how, what are the best beam angles to use for, for this geometry? Let's assume we have two options. Let, let's assume we have two lateral beams fixed that we want to use. And then we have to decide whether we use the anterior beam in addition to the lateral beams or the posterior beam, as shown in the lower figure here. So, what do you think? What what is better? Well, I would I would use the uh, anterior beam because it has a higher dose at the entrance side than the exit side. Yes, um, and then that's why you are Rock Mackey and you have the, the the smart insights. Probably most people would would say the opposite, namely that they they would use the posterior beam because the posterior beam spares the organ at risk, right? So in conventional, say in 3D conformal radiation therapy, you would probably use the, the posterior beam. Mm -hmm. But in IMRT, because you have the potential to reduce the intensity in the center part of the field to, to block the organ at risk, mm -hmm. it's actually better to use the anterior beam. So mm -hmm. the beam selection problem in IMRT and, and 3D conformal therapy are very different. It's, it's, it is a challenge. Yeah, and, and in fact, in the general IMRT case, you, you tend to have the higher intensity beams closer to the organs at risk. And that was shown by the classic paper by Brahmi in, in, uh, that really started IMRT in 1983, where he treated um, a uh, torus or a donut shape and uh, tried to spare the whole of the donut. And you see the highest intensity beams are just skimming tangentially. Uh, to the whole of the, of the donut, the, the region that, that you want to spare, and you have less dose uh, away from uh, the, the region to spare. Exactly. I'm glad that you mentioned Anders Brahme because he has influenced the field of IMRT a lot. He has a lot of impact. 
and including designing the first MLC. So the first MLC was designed uh, back in the set in the seventies by Anders Brahma and group and the, and, um, the Microtron um, by Scandatronics uh, was a fifty MeV. It had a fifty mm -hmm. M MV beam um, and uh, and electron energy is up to fifty MeV on that as well. So a very advanced machine for its time. All right. Now another problem that uh, that came up in uh, bringing IMRT from the you know bench to the bedside, so to speak, is how do we do the QA and the uh, evaluation of the intensity modulated uh, treatment fields? So in, in conventional treatment fields, where it's essentially just the shape of the field, uh, it is is enough to make sure that the shape of the field agrees with the planning, uh, the planned shape of the field. With intensity modulated fields, it's not only the shape, but also the intensity or the dose at each point in the field. So we needed new ways to do the quality assurance. And uh, here we have, th this is the most frequently cited uh, publication in medic medical physics over all years. It's by Dan Lowe, Harms, Susan Mutish, and uh, Jim Purdy, published in 98. And they, they address this question and this problem, how do we do the, how do we quantify differences between the uh, delivered intensity map and the planned intensity map, which is enormously important, of course, because the counter argument against IMRT has always been that it's way too complex, and it's too easy to make mistakes. How do we make sure that we actually get in the patient what we are planning, what we're seeing in the planning system. So th th their idea was essentially to take two metrics. One is the distance to agreement metric that measures uh, the geometry in a way, and also the dose difference metric uh, for the for the y-axis here. To combine them into a, a integrated uh, uh, term that they called the gamma value. And, and the gamma value also has the interesting and important characteristic that it's a pass-fail criteria. So if, the, if you pre-select uh, acceptance criteria of say 3% dose difference and 3 millimeter spatial difference uh, offset, then uh, if you feed that into this gamma value concept uh, and whenever you get a gamma value that's below one, you are within tolerance and if it's above one, it's outside of the roads. So that, that is another development that has been had enormous important impact on, on our field. And, and a nice thing about this metric was that uh, the um, at low grade re regions, for example, uh, inside a tumor, um, what's really important is the is the uh, difference in dose compared to the prescription. Whereas um, in a high grade region, uh, then what you care about is the distance to that high gradient. And so the, really the clever part here was have, uh, realizing that and having a metric that uh, was kind of independent. So either you worried about the high, where, where the high gradient is or you worried about what the absolute dose was. And then um, they were kind of independent, almost like two dimensions. And so you could then make a combined one uh, by, by, the, by just adding them in quadrature. So, and that assigned then a pixel value um, or a voxel value uh, of, of, of goodness that you could either display as a map or you could or you could graph or, or you could make a, a graph or you could report the um, statistics uh, of, of, of how much you, how much of the volume is is good and how much is bad so extremely clever met metric you can fool it a few times uh, and there's been papers subsequently about situations where bad plans look like they uh, pass this but in general, uh, it's a it's a very useful concept. The last uh, of this series of papers that are related to IMRT delivery on standard linear, linear accelerators is by uh, Tom Lozasso and, and colleagues from the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And uh, I described sort of the ideal way of uh, intensive relation using multi-leaf coding matters by this unidirectional sweep of, of the uh, leaves across the field. That assumes that the uh, intensity uh, 
in the open part of the field is 100% and on the closed part of the field is uh, zero. But in, in reality, of course, the, the situation is different. The, uh, for practical reasons, uh, uh, most multi-leaf polymeters uh, at, the at the time and even today have this uh, rounded leaf end shape shown in the top part of the figure. When, when I was in, in Heidelberg, we designed uh, double, what we call double focusing multi-leaf collimators that would really shape uh, or move the leaves on, on a surface of a sphere so that, that at every opening angle uh, the leaf ends are focused on, on the source. But that, that, that was a very challenging mechanical design, and, and so that, that's why most commercial MLCs followed the design shown here, namely the rounded leaf end that, that you know, projects towards the, the source. One, one question with that design uh, is uh, shown at the top, is that the geometrical penumbra, uh, which is just zero percent transmission on the, on the, the block part of the leaf, may not agree with the dosimetric penumbra because there is some transmission through the thin part of the leaf and on this side here that I'm showing right here. So the question was how much does that affect the dose distribution? And uh, Tom Lozaso and, and, and colleagues showed that, that it leads to effectively a one millimeter shift of the dosimetric penumbra versus the geometric, geometric penumbra. Yeah, and, and of course, this is a, a pain in the treatment planning system because you really have to uh, account for this to get I or T right, especially if you're using lots of close leaf gaps. Um, and the other potential problem then um, is um, is that the this this partial trend transmission also leads to scatter uh, more more scatter than you would would have if you had a doubly diverging uh, MLC like. As a matter of fact, the, the first MLC that Brahmic produced was doubly diverging, and then Siemens produced a doubly diverging one. So it's certainly possible to produce a doubly diverging one, but they're more expensive to build. The, the second uh, challenge with uh, multi-leaf IMRT delivery was this uh, so-called tongue and groove effect. So the leaves in the lateral profile are shaped like this. There, there's a tongue on one side of the leaves that goes into the groove of the ne uh, neighboring leaf here. And the purpose of that is to reduce interleaf leakage. If the tongue and groove did not exist, then there would be more higher intensity going through in between two neighboring leaves, right? And, and that um, might be at a level that is not acceptable. But the one consequence of this tongue and groove uh, construction um, is that uh, it leads to a um, dependency of the delivered dose on the sequence with which we um, deliver the, the intensity of the dose. For example, if you consider that two leaves are open in one section, then of course you have full transmission in the open part of the field. But if you first open one leaf and keep the other closed, and then do the opposite, you know, switch and, and you know, um, close the first leaf and open the second leaf, then uh, you will always have the central part of the field blocked by, by the tongue of, of one of the leaves shown here. And so that, that, that uh, had some impact on, on the design of the so-called sequencing algorithms that defined the trajectories, as I said before, for a given intensity profile. But it was a solvable problem, it was just one thing to be considered. In, in fact, another way to solve the problem uh, is to stack uh, more than one set of, of MLCs on top of each other, uh, moving them by a half a leaf spacing. It gives you effectively high, higher resolution uh, as well um, and, uh, and then eliminates the issue of leaf leakage. Exactly, and that was also done in, done in following designs and other systems. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is a paper um, by, by Jeff Sewardson and David Jaffrey when they were at uh, Beaumont Hospital in, um, just outside Detroit. Um, and so this was uh, really a series, one of a series of papers that described using a flat panel, and flat panels had come into existence at this point for, uh, for radiology, for replacement of, um, 
of film and radiology. And so they, they um, and, these, and these systems, by the way, have relatively slow, uh, slow readouts, typically frame rates that are, are more like a camera, 30, 30 hertz or so. Whereas a conventional uh, fan beam CT scanner would have readout rates of the thousands of samples a second instead of 30 frames a second. However, in, ra in radiation therapy, uh, with a gantry uh, turning slowly by, by, by convention and law, uh, then uh, this has adequate sampling for CT scanning uh, for, for radiation therapy. Uh, in a conventional fan beam CT scanner, um, the, um, the um, uh, fan angle is quite large. It's, it's about 45 degrees or so. Um, so that you can get a, a relatively large slice and a, a large lateral field, field of view. But the cone angle is very, very small. So the area then is a kind of a beam is a, is a narrow rectangle. In a cone beam CT, you essentially have relatively uh, a smaller fan, fan angle, but a much bigger cone angle, and so that the area of the beam is, is, uh, is much more. And so what, you end up hap what ends up happening is that you get a lot more scatter in cone beam CT than you would be in fan beam CT. And, and the graph uh, here is showing that, that um, as you uh, increase um, the, the thickness of the, of the, of the patient, um, and these were actually just done, or, or this graph was done ju just with fixed uh, uh, polystyrene sheets, and that uh, you get to a point where, where you have a uh, hundred times more scatter signal to a, to a detector than you do primary signal. So the, the signal is almost entirely scattered. Um, interestingly, it is, of course, possible to, um, to um, estimate the scatter, and this paper showed the dependencies of uh, scatter, but, but it's still, still difficult to completely remove the, um, the scatter in modern comb combing CT scanners. Uh, because again, it's, it's, oh, it, it dominates the signal. Um, interesting, you can see that in this case there's two uh, bone ob objects, and so so you see a, a darkened area uh, in between, which would make it look like it's a lower density region, and this is because uh, this there, there's too much there's more scatter um, that is um, is being rep represented, and and that looks like less attenuation. So that's fundamentally what what's happening. An interesting thing is notice that the that the noise um, in the high, um, uh, and by the way, SPR is um, scatter, scatter to primary ratio. Notice that the, that the noise, is, it's less uh, in high, sig uh, in high uh, scatter to primary ratios, and that's simply because there are more photons, and so, and, and noise is essentially dependent upon the photons uh, hitting one detector compared to the photons hitting the other detector. Now this doesn't really improve image quality, but it's just something to uh, of interest. It appears to be a smoother, um, a smoother image. Now we are moving to intensity relation for a different modality, namely protons. Um, the general um, clinical benefit of IMRT in uh, X-ray therapy has been to shape the dose around organs at risk for complex shaped target volumes as shown in, in this paraspinal case here. Now with proton therapy we could do that already without intense stimulation, namely we could use and say a beam from this direction and stop the beam right in front of the critical structure for example the spinal cord. So that, that, that there was no need for intense stimulation to shape fields uh, for convex concave target volumes. But as shown by Tony Lomax and, and others from the Paul Scherer Institute in a publication in 2001, intensity modulation turned out to be very, very uh, uh, useful also for proton therapy for a number of other reasons. And, and, and one reason is shown here, namely the, uh, the reason that uh, IMPT, as it's called, intensity related proton therapy, can be designed so that it is more robust against uncertainties such as range, uh, proton range uncertainty. Here we see a design of a three-treatment uh, technique for, for this specific problem. 
and um, so we have uh, one beam uh, coming in this direction and covering the gray shaded part of the, of the field. Then we have a second beam in this direction and producing this gray shaded or covering this gray shaded, shaded part. And you see that both are avoiding the critical structure. So there's no issue with range uncertainty, even if the beam overshoots, the spinal cord or other critical structures would not be affected. And the third beam is, is uh, uh, shown here, and, and that again has zero intensity or very low intensity in the central part that would be at risk to, to overdose the, the critical structure. So by combining these, these three fields, we get a uniform coverage of the target volume and a sparing of the organ at risk. But not only that, we get that without the price of uh, potentially overdosing the organ at risk in a situation where we have an overshoot of the proton being beyond the planned range. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting in proton radiation therapy. We the, we brag about the brag peak, how, how sharp it is and high resolution. Uh, unfortunately, it's like a really sharp knife. Um, it can cause a lot of harm too if it's not wielded correctly. Uh, and you know what really this field needs is is some way to make sure we know where the where the protons actually are. Then we could start to use the the high gradient part of the beam right against normal tissues or between normal tissue structures and tumors um, and, and uh, like sharpen radiotherapy. So this is a, a paper about um, respiration gated radiotherapy and, and clearly uh, it's all about um, making sure that the beam is uh, going to the uh, target volume when the target volume is in motion. And so in gating what you do is you hold off the beam when, when um, the beam is uh, not well centered uh, with respect to the target volume or inside the margins that you've made on the target volume and, and turn it on when, when it is uh, in, that, in that space. And so this, this paper is all about gathering the parameters that you're going to need uh, for doing that planning. So the planning is about the capabilities of the patient um, in order to uh, breath hold for example, you, do you want to do the breath holding uh, at inspiration or expiration? People tend to do it on expiration, but some patients uh, actually find it easier to do uh, on uh, the gating when it's fully inspired. The, um, the other I issue is, um, is phasing. Is this patient staying, staying a, in a regular breathing pattern or, or uh, do you have to worry about the, the patient then for whatever reason taking breaths faster or slower. Um, the, um, the, the, the system is relatively straight straightforward. You would have um, a infrared uh, 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 emitter and infrared camera looking at uh, infrared markers on the patient. So this can be done in a, in a pretty well lit room because there's not much interference of infrared um, with respect to normal visible uh, lighting. And um, so really, the, ma the main story here is how big do you make the planning target volume with respect to the, the CTV, the clinical target volume, so that uh, you can um, be as efficient as possible. So a bigger margin will allow you to be more efficient and deliver the, 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 the treatment with, with less stoppage of the beam. Um, and if you want to have a very small target volume, or sorry, a small planning target volume with respect to the CTV, a small margin, then you have to essentially waste more time. And so it's an optimization of clinical benefit uh, versus uh, practical, practical necessity in the busy clinic. Let's move to the next one. All the papers that we discussed so far were landmark papers that had a very, very big impact in terms of the clinical use and, and uh, they are most of all, essentially all of them, are being used on a routine basis in the clinics today. We also selected a couple of papers that are not in routine use yet, but that have very great potential in our opinion. And uh, this is one of them. So uh, it's uh, about microbeam radiation. The idea here is that we use uh, 
the synchrotron radiation, and, and this is from a broader Krish and, and others uh, from the European uh, synchrotron radiation facility in Grenoble. And uh, the synchrotron radiation can be shaped uh, uh, at a very high, uh, you know, uh, uh, level of granularity. So they, they use uh, beams of about 20 micrometer thickness, and then uh, they uh, have the peaks of, of the beams, and then they have valleys that are maybe 100 micrometers long. So it's um, it's pulsed in a way. It's a delta-shaped type of dose delivery. We will discuss two papers that are related to delta. What I call delta delivery. One is delta delivery in space. And that's the micro beam idea. And then later we also discuss delta delivery in terms of time, which is the flash radiation therapy. And that they have interesting biological potential that hasn't been fully explored yet. But you know it's. It's interesting to look at both the physics and the biology of this problem. So one physical problem that was discussed in this paper is how to do the symmetry for these very, very fine beams of, like I said, only 20 micrometers wide. And in this case, they used uh, a dosimeter on a chip using MOSFET uh, transistors. Uh, and in the, lower, in the lower part of the figure, uh, you see a very, very sharp increase of the dose towards the, the peak. It's a little bit difficult to see here, but this is on a log scale. So we, we see a three order uh, increase in terms of the intensity of the dose over the fraction of a millimeter. So that, that's a much, much higher uh, dose grading that we can uh, create in any of the conventional treatment techniques. And the biological potential is, is really fascinating. I've seen pictures from them where they show that they use the, the micro beam for, for small animals, I believe. And you can really essentially cut the tissue in slices, uh, but you get almost no effect on, on the normal tissue, even though that very small part within the high dose part of the beam gets uh, potentially destroyed. Yeah, so an interesting thing here is that how much of, the, of this microbeam effect is due to the, uh, the high dose rate, because the, there's a high dose rate going on here as well. So, but, but the classical reason for the microbeam um, is that uh, it's felt that the normal tissue can, can uh, uh, stem cells can migrate uh, small, small distances and fill in for the, uh, for the normal tissues. Uh, cells that are in the beam. But if, if the flash effect actually works, maybe that's not so important. Yeah, or a combination of the two. Or a combination mm -hmm. of the two, yeah. Yeah, so this is um, the first, uh, so we talked about gating, and the other way, of course, uh, to deal with motion um, is to follow the motion. So in other words, to be able to track the motion. And so this was the, the first uh, motion tracking system um, it was developed uh, by, uh, by Accuray on their, um, on their CyberKnife system. And basically they, they used both an IR tracking system so that they could look at motion on the surface of the patient, but they were also using um, orthogonal X-ray sources at, at an oblique angle uh, to uh, inspect the target line. And they were using internal, internal markers uh, then as well as external markers. And so they developed a way then to predict where the motion was going and to have the robot, which is, is able to uh, keep up with the motion uh, and uh, follow, follow it around. Uh, interestingly, this is, uh, Accuray has also um, recently uh, implemented uh, real-time tracking on the, on the Tomo therapy machine using uh, the two X-ray system that, um, that I first proposed in, in uh, 93 to be able to do orthogonal pairs of x-rays, one megavoltage and one kilovoltage, uh, to do the same thing, to track tumors um, in that system in real time. And the tracking there is done by moving the jaws um, and, follow, and following with the jaws and following with the MLCs. This paper um, is about uh, the, the, really the properties of uh, an unflattened uh, photon beam. 
So, so as you see here, bremsstrahlen uh, is mainly in the forward direction. So that, um, that the uh, intensity uh, is forward peaked. And as the energy increases, it becomes even more for, forward peaked. So at 18 uh, MV, as compared to 6 MV, it's, it's, it's more on flat. Um, and so what's really going on here is that, yes, the intensity is changing and, you know, we, we field flattening filters can flatten this out and so that we have uniform fields. But for intensity modulated radiation therapy, there's no point in starting with a flat field. If you want a flat field, you can always intensity modulate the field flat. And not having a field flattening filter makes it easier to do the treatment planning. Because in, in treatment planning, at least model-based treatment, treatment planning, what you need to do is explicitly calculate the attenuation of a lot of rays, the primary rays incident on the patient. And by putting a flattening filter in, you are perturbing the energy of the beam. Whereas if you don't put a field flattening filter in, it's the, you're essentially not perturbing the energy of the beam. Because the Bremsstrom process itself uh, isn't very energy dependent uh, on angle. Uh, and so, um, you know, dynamic jaws have essentially replaced wedges as well for the same reason, uh, because it's easier to uh, effectively modulate the intensity than to deal with the changing energy in treatment planning. And it was the same idea on symptomal therapy, right? Yes, oh yes, no, the, the, actually the Accuray had the first flattening field, flattening uh, uh, free uh, filter or, or no filter, uh, no uh, no flattening filter, but they had a relatively small small field. So tomotherapy was the first one that really uh, used this. And, and by the way, you can uh, it's a spectrometer too because as uh, if if the energy of the LINAC changes, the angle will will change, and it's actually easier to detect the energy by the change in this angle uh, if you have a good detector. Than it is to do a depth dose curve. The next paper um, was also enormously impactful in our field. That's about volumetric modulated art therapy or VMAT. And that's the type of IMRT that's being used in the clinic essentially everywhere today. The um, uh, idea was proposed um, some years earlier before this paper was published, but the challenge was to calculate the uh, trajectory, uh, the speed of the gantry as it continuously rotates around the patient and uh, the intensity uh, of the beam and the shaping of the multi-leaf collimator. So it's as Rob and, and I discussed before, it's, um, it's, it's a more involved problem than calculating the intensity maps for static fields. The clinical advantage is, of course, that uh, the delivery is much faster, whereas with conventional IMRT, sometimes for difficult cases, uh, it could take 20 minutes or so to deliver an IMRT field. field. And, and with the arc therapy idea, uh, the treatment delivery time in the, you know, on the machine could be reduced to a few minutes. So uh, Carl Otto uh, came up with a method to calculate uh, the MLC positions as a function of the gantry angle and, 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 the, and the speed of the gantry at, at every angle. And, uh, and the methods were later refined, but essentially uh, the, the idea is still so fundamentally the same. Uh, that we can accelerate the delivery of IMRT by using a dynamic delivery techniques. And, and uh, some publications have shown that this not only increases the delivery speed, but also the quality of the treatment plan, comparing VMAT versus uh, IMRT. Uh, I, I will say that that, that that depends very much on the number of beams that are being used. So uh, in conventional IMRT, let's call it that, uh, the, typically, we use seven or nine IMRT fields. Um, and that was based on studies we did way back in the 1990s that showed that you cannot get much, much better if you increase the number of things much beyond that number. But in reality, you can. And, and uh, um, so if you use, say, 19 instead of nine IMRT beams, you get a dose solution that looks very, very much like a VMAT plant and sometimes even better. So I think with very much faster delivery techniques, 
um, that are available today in the more modern machines, and we will discuss one of one example in one of the next papers. Um, the question whether we use VMAT or IMRT becomes more, more blurry. Is this yours or, or mine? That's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so this is a um, this is a, um, a paper on um, a pre a pre configured um, uh, linear accelerator. It happens to be the Halcyon. Uh, Halcyon, by the way, looks looks a lot like the tomotherapy machine. It's a it's a ring gantry or O ring ga gantry um, machine. The the accelerator then spins around. Um, uh, in this particular case, uh, around 360 degrees, and then spins around the other way. It, it doesn't happen to have a slipper in like like a tomotherapy machine or or the reflection machine does uh, now as well, which is another O-ring based machine. In fact, you could say that uh, you know the uh, the Unity is a is an O-ring sh shaped machine, except the thickness uh, to support an MR is is, is very deep and. And, and the and the uh, uh, you know the, the uh, basic thing about this, this paper isn't the configuration though of of the um, of the gantry, but it's pre-configuring the, uh, the the planning parameters uh, into the system, and instead of uh, having it commissioned. In other words, this is a pre-commissioned machine, at, like other machines are today and tomotherapy was as well, that uh, really allows then the medical physicist not to have to take commissioning measurements, which they're likely not to do as well um, as um, a, um, uh, a canned golden beam data set um, that can come from the vendor. And the vendor offering this, of course, requires them to keep the machine in that, that same condition of delivery. And, and this is describing tests. In fact, this is a nice uh, display of, of tests that can be applied uh, to verify that, uh, that in fact, the golden beam data or the pre-configured data supporting the treatment planning system is, in fact, correct. And the responsibility then uh, goes from the medical physicist making uh, water phantom me measurements to commission the beam to making uh, Simpler, and more, and, and, but more often, uh, tests of the machine after after servicing. But in fact, uh, they should be doing that anyway. So the bottom line is, you can have um, a um, as even more accuracy, I think, because the commissioning is is right. Uh, you are do, you are making measurements after every every certain major servicing operation, and of course, rut routinely just to check if, if there's no servicing. Uh, and this is likely a better approach um, uh, to, uh, to uh, the workflow of quality assurance than to fool around with uh, setting up your treatment planning system. Of course, it requires the vendors make a, make a cookie cutter machine that uh, everyone is essentially is identical to the one before it. So that there's still a lot of uh, dynamics in then the development of these treatment techniques. And I'm curious uh, if we did this exercise again in 10 years from now, I'm, I'm wondering what we would discuss then. Well, I think we'd be discussing, the, we would be evaluating artificial intelligence because we'd have a, t a ton of data that would be hard for us to evaluate. And we're, you know, we'd probably be measuring the exit beams as well to infer what the, the dose was at each fraction. Um, and artificial intelligence would tell us if our machine is right or not. And maybe it would tune itself. Yeah. Okay, the last paper. Yeah, so this is a really clever, this is something you can all do at home. Um, the, this is um, uh, an idea from, um, from Mag Magdalena uh, Brezilova Carter um, in Victoria, British Columbia who um, showed that you can get flash-like dose rates just with a conventional x-ray tube. So in other words, the, the intensity of the beam at the window, just after the window of the x-ray tube is so high that you can get uh, uh, very, uh, dose, uh, dose rates you can see um, in, in you know, even up to hundreds of, 
gray per second. You have, in flash, you have to be about higher than 40 gray per second. So this is useful. It's not going to be useful for treating patients, but it's useful for doing research, for example, on the effects on cell lines or the effects, for example, on skin on small animals. Um, and in fact, I'm sure you could do the same thing with a LINAC. If you, if you were to place the cells uh, right up against the target, if the target was close to the electron beam, you could get very high dose rates in a, in a LINAC for photons. And we know by taking out the target, the electron beams a long distance away is also um, at, at the flash do dose rates. So uh, we uh, talked uh, earlier about uh, flash a little bit, and and um, I'd like I'd like to get um, uh, Tom Thomas's opinion on on flash before I give my opinion. Okay. Uh, well, there's certainly a big flash hype at this time. And whether it's justified or not, I, I'm not able to say. Um, but I mean, biologically, it's, it's a fascinating uh, thing to explore. Physically, there are big challenges, and and clinically, there are uh, prices to be paid. Uh, for example, as you said, uh, the flash effect typically starts at about 10 gray. So um, that means fractionation is uh, maybe not possible at all or only at a very limited uh, level. Then multi-field treatments are also questionable. I mean, one possibility is to treat all fields at the same time, but that's again technically very demanding. Mm -hmm. So we have to really understand the effect. First of all, we have to understand the effect better from the biological side, but then we also have to understand what is the price to be paid, what we give up in terms of all the technology that have has been delivered to this point and that we, some of it uh, we discussed in, in this video. Yeah, so I mean fractionation will give you about tens of percent uh, benefit. And so that's why the field, uh, since the French Tribondo um, in you know, 1920 or so, we had fractionated radiation therapy. Now if this proves to be factor of two or, or higher in effect, I think we'll all switch to flash. But if it's if it's a few tens of percent, um, it uh, probably is giving away more than it's um, it's uh, benefiting. But we'll see. We'll see. All right. Thank you very much for your attention, and, and thanks so much, Rob, for your time. And uh, Rob came to Boston to, to visit me here so that we could do this video together right after the dedic. So th thanks. It was so a, ple much. a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity.